Hello, my name is Melissa Jennison and welcome to Discussions in Audio Mastering. literature attached to a CD or DVD, final record or tape cassette, and ever wondered what does mastering mean? While most of us understand the terms recording and mixing, very few recognise mastering. It is the aim of these discussions to inform and educate those interested in audio about the art of mastering. We were fortunate enough to have discussions with five top Melbourne-based mastering engineers who shed some light and engineering wisdom on this little known and understood audio process. It's more than a day job. You yeah. Know? It's something that takes a long time to understand. And I think back and listen to things that I had done even 10 years ago and think, what, what was I thinking? I mean, it, mastering involves you're not just a mastering engineer the first day that you begin. Uh, it's all about experience and making the right decisions. You really have to do your time. Yeah. Uh, and you have to make those decisions really quickly and not be fatigued five hours into the day, mm. uh, every working day of your life. It's something that you have to work on continuously. So stamina, <laughs> concentration, being fresh, and, uh, you know, those things um, play a part every day of my life. So if you can't stay focused, then you best look at a different uh, career path. <laughs> you could line 10 up mastering engineers up in a row and get 10 different ways of working. Uh, it's a very personal thing. What led you into becoming a mastering engineer? Originally, I used to... Uh, when I was working as a mix engineer and recording engineer, I would razor blade my uh, work together, that is edit together. And uh, then uh, when I bought a DAT machine, I uh, started, uh, I purchased uh, some software from DigiDesign and a Mac SE30 and a 600 meg hard drive at a great expense of uh, $20,000 and uh, started cutting my mixes together in the computer. And people started bringing me DATs to edit of theirs uh, and uh, to cut their verses and choruses together and so forth and so I started doing that for other people and uh, I'd listen to it along the way and go gee it could uh, do with a bit of travel and they said that guy's a mastering engineer. <laughs> well uh, as I've often told people mastering is uh, something that found me rather than the other way around. Um, well, I was overseas in New York, um, left there, Australia as a youngster, just went out for a trip and um, met a guy who was a master engineer. And um, he, uh, because I came from a DJ background, and um, he said to me one day, look, how would you like to make your own records? This is back in the days of vinyl, so we, you know. And I thought, oh, yeah, I was intrigued by the whole thing. So he, um, he showed me a lathe and how the lacquer was cut. And, and I, I just found a real affinity with it and uh, I love the fact that the process is really quick and as opposed to sitting in a mixed studio where you'd be listening to kick drum for four hours non-stop where 
over the course of a day you could roll through different projects so and the fact that it was something that didn't have a lot of prestige or profile so more and more people were banging on the door to get into become producers mix engineers what have you and not that many people wanted to get into the mastering so for me i thought well it stands to reason that i'll have a great opportunity to get working within the industry and uh and so that's how it kind of happened okay well i was um doing recording and mixing um and uh the sequence of events was that um we had our first baby and during that first six months of her life i was doing two albums um and they basically took up uh, six days a week 14 hours a day for six months and so um and my wife also runs a, a large business and so she was kind of like busy as um so i managed to find a way of staying doing sound engineering but working more sensible hours <laughs> so that's kind of what led me into mastering i gradually eased into it um over the next i suppose couple of years but um yeah that was the thrust behind it was to sort of um not become a workaholic sound engineer yeah. no i mean i was really even unaware about the mastering process i was more really geared into the recording and the mixing process that's what i wanted to do i was not aware of that um, process, not even through studies. That was never even mentioned before. It's very much a behind the scenes thing. So um, when I started at a studio, I was fairly oblivious to it, I have to admit. But then I got introduced to it um, through cassette mastering. I still wanted to go back to the studio. I still dragged myself back there. But then eventually I got called to do more mastering. And then when CDs came in and cassettes started dying off, um, I was introduced into the CD mastering room and uh, then I just there was I was asked to stay there basically and um, there was a lot of work at the time there and um, I just ended up staying there so I kind of found me just through being at a studio really rather than me searching it out and wanting to do that really. Yeah. Well uh, I'm not sure if I was led into it so much uh, more than the fact that it found its way to me perhaps. Um, I was a teenager when I was working in a studio that had uh, vinyl, they were a vinyl broker as well as a cassette manufacturing plant. They had a studio, jazz label. I was really interested in being a producer and engineer, really. And, uh, you know, wrapping up mic leads, making coffees and <clears throat> doing those things. I had high aspirations, but the vinyl and, and cassette side of things did require mastering. And uh, every now and then the, uh, the guy doing those things was absent and the boss kind of uh, recognised the fact that I had a good EQ sense so dragged me into the cassette mastering room and the editing room for vinyl and uh, I slowly learnt what needed to be done. Always wanting to still be a producer mixer but uh, the more I tried to get out of it the more I was dragged into those mastering rooms and uh, I haven't left really ever since. It was a long time ago you now and uh, yeah, so my passions have changed. Could you give us an example of common mistakes often made in the recording studio which can affect the mastering process? Well, I was trying to think about that question and one of the things, okay, that I often have issues with is a sibilant vocalist on a dull piece of music. Sibilance. Sibilance is caused by uh, overt emphasis on the S. There's two kinds of sibilance. Holy shit, Batman, Suffer and Succotash. They're the two components with that sibilance. And in fact, if you've got a bride vocalist who's got bad dental condition, or an engineer that's used a bright microphone and then EQ'd some top end into it, it can, ex or uh, inappropriate attack release on the compressor, all of those things can exacerbate the sibilance. Where, if the track is dull and needs some top end injected into it to brighten it up, and we've got a sibilant vocalist, the sibilance goes nuts. Mm. Okay, so that's a very, major issue for mix engineers to be aware of. Could you give us an example of common mistakes often made in the recording studio 
which can affect the mastering process. Whenever I'm listening to a vocalist that I'm going to record, one of the things that I think about is if I'm going to have sibilant issues or if I listen to them talking and I hear that their voice may be potentially sibilant, I will go and find a dull microphone. Not a microphone with a presence lift up at 8 to 10k, which can exacerbate the sibilance. I'm talking a dull microphone, so you can wind some top end in maybe 4 to 5k, and, not, and it won't exacerbate too much of that top, top end sibilance that is there. That said, women's sibilance is higher in frequency range than, there, than men's. So there's a whole rate, uh, the sibilance is an issue for mastering engineers that uh, can, that mix engineers can be conscious of. Mm. The bottom end, okay, that's a, don't, don't, uh, it's better to have a relatively neutral sounding record that a mastering engineer can impose some global top end and bottom end tightness into with compression and EQ, rather than EQ massive amounts of bottom end in and where it goes nuts on another set of monitors, you know? I mean, I think that the best thing that mix engineers can do, or one of the things they can do, is reference on a few different sets of monitors behind me. I don't know whether you can see in screen. I've got NS10s here, I've got Oritones, I've got, you know, your computer home stereo kind of job. Uh, I've got uh, acoustic reset speakers, and I could go and find another two or three sets of monitors and I've got two sets of monitors downstairs in my recording studio that I use. In my mastering room, I've got one set of monitors that I live and die with because I know that these monitors tell me the truth. But in the studio where people are uncertain, get, take the record out and listen to it in the car. Listen to it in, but the problem is, you listen to it in 17 different places and you get 17 different opinions on, on how it's feeling or how it sounds. So, you know, I mean, go with what you know but uh, don't over EQ. That's another thing. Mm. Um, <clears throat> a, a lot of my time is spent removing um, room resonant frequencies from recordings. So um, recordings that are made in um, less than ideal home studios tend to they tend to record everything in the same room. And if that room's got a particular ringing frequency, then that frequency will be ringing through the whole record. Um, so once you've identified what that frequency is, you can sort of get rid of it fairly easily. Obviously, it depends on the key of the song. Um, if the ringing is in, at an A note and the song's in A, it's going to be worse. Um, but yeah, that's kind of one of the, the big things I find, particularly on analog kind of um, um, you know recordings with with real people playing rather than with machines playing. Mm. Well, I think just general bad engineering. In 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 a, in a general in in a general terms, um, I, I can't really sort of you know give specifics, but you know any mix has got some really out of whack kind of features, like it's just a super super duper loud vocal or not enough vocal, or you know really loud kick drum or too much sibilance, and and again all those things are, are fall under the umbrella of you know bad engineering skill or lack of engineering skill, so it, it's really hard for me to kind of sit back and really judge you know, my brethren who are engineers as well, because it's a whole different discipline altogether. So again, it's, I, I, it's, it's, it's a difficult one to answer the specifics as in what is wrong, but just general bad engineering skills um, makes my job uh, more difficult. And, and so one of the things I tend to do with um, my work is I'll have a listening session with a client beforehand and that helps, it's like an insurance policy, it, it tends to eliminate those sort of issues. So a client will call, it, it, particularly this will pertain to someone I haven't worked with before. So um, if I don't know about their history or where they work from, we'll come in and have a listening session and then I'll check it out and I'm listening for the obvious things. Um, I tend to be very forgiving with the mixes because again, it's their art form. And sometimes there's certain things in the mix that are there by design. And so you've got to be really careful about what kind of feedback you give. So I'm looking for particularly obtuse kind of things in there. Mm -hmm. So uh, so we'll sit down and we can nut that out. And because so many people now mixing their own stuff, it's easier then to go back, make the adjustments, and then we go back and we can work on it and uh, get, they can get the most out of the process. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, look, if a, if a recording studio doesn't have the acoustics just right and the monitoring just right that's 
where you're going to get issues coming into mastering because we're going to be hearing those flaws. So a lot of times home studios don't have, say, the proper bass treatment. So the engineers might be putting, they put excessive bass into a recording, excessive bass that they can't actually hear in their room. It's sounding just right. And then you take it out of that environment and it explodes. There's so much bass, you know. So the bottom end is a big problem. It's easier to get top end and mid range right um, because they're less um, influenced by the surroundings. They still are, but bass much more. It's more important to treat bass in a room. So I'm finding that with a lot of records, we really need to pay attention to bass and bottom end and subsonic frequencies. And if you don't have a room that can produce that faithfully, um, subsonics can get out of control, you know. Um, I do a lot of um, hip hop and electronic mastering and um, some of it's great, but there's some of it that's pretty out of control in the bottom end. So that has to be reined in. And that's because these guys don't have the production systems at home to, to, to reproduce those um, uh, frequencies. So they're kind of oblivious that there's all this murkiness happening there. And uh, it's really up to the mastering engineer to rein that in and tidy that up. But um, yeah, generally speaking, bottom end needs to be worked on, I think, very frequently, more so than top end and mid range. It's, it's the trickiest area to get right. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of fundamental inf information in the lower registers and um, sometimes even specific bass notes can seem to just disappear and some are very loud and you have to try and even that up um, and as I said it's really got to do with monitoring and acoustics and that costs a lot of money and some you know sometimes people just don't have that money to afford if they're just doing something on their own or on a budget. Yeah, yeah. Why do some CDs sound so much better than others? In saying this, why do major record label releases sound so polished, while a great many indie releases don't have the same quality? Well, there's, there are a lot of factors involved. Um, obviously, budget plays a massive part. Mm. Uh, although some artists do have a big budget, but they don't have the right person for the job. So everything really has to be in place and done correctly if you want that big polished budget sound, but not every artist actually wants that sound. Yeah. Some people uh, prefer to have a more of a lo-fi sound, um, so <clears throat> you know, a lot of planning is involved and all the boxes have to be ticked. Uh, expense, the, the player, really, you have yeah. to know, play the instrument really well, have the right instrument, the basics, great microphone, great studio. Uh, the expense involved in getting the right takes and experimenting with the sound, with the right engineer who's experienced, <laughs> mm. all of those things play a part for that polished sound. And usually if one of those factors are not present, so something will, will suffer somewhere along the line, yeah. if that's the sound that you're going for. Mm. Mm. I've heard amazing recordings, of course, two microphones stuck in a garage. Uh, uh, I think budget plays a big role in that um, I think it's also the the personnel that's involved on the record that, uh, that that's involved that and um, I think they're the two main things but the budget plays a big role but having said that you look I've worked on a lot of records that where the budgets have been very humble the equipment's been really humble but the, the skill set of the engineer and the producer and the artist has been really fantastic and so they've been able to produce something quite amazing um, but for the most part I think you know broad sense um, budget <laughs> Driver. Yeah. <laughs> they, they've been worked on by the best people. You know, the most expensive studios um, and the biggest budgets. Now, all of those parameters within the equation are not the absolute key to success. In my mind, what makes a great CD, and I'm not necessarily a great sounding CD, but a great CD is the enjoyment that the listener gets off the music. Now, that's what really what we're talking about here for me, you know, it, and it doesn't need to be the most expensive record because there's, there's no guarantee that with all those things, the great studio, the great engineer, the great producer, the great master engineer, that the record is going to sell a bucket load. It might sound great, but it might be shinola, very shiny shinola, mm -hmm. you know, 
or crapola or whatever we want to say, you know. So, you know, uh, people and people don't listen to a record and go, listen to the sound of that. They go, I like this. It's a gut feeling. They go, I like this, turn it up. I hate this, turn it off. Mm. You know, and it's not based on this record cost $100,000 to make and was mastered by the best mastering engineer around. It's based on an emotional, in, instant gut feeling. Mm. Is there anything you would instruct people to do regarding preparing their recording for mastering? Um, well, I usually just say, you know, uh, try and give me the, the stereo file or, you know, if it's a stereo file and not stems, at the maximum level you can go to without going into clipping. Um, so that the loudest peak is at zero, and so that um, uh, and to use the same sampling rate as they're using for their session. So don't dither it down to 44.1 because they're going to CD, because I'm going to be doing a lot of my processing analog anyway, so it doesn't matter, it can be as high a sampling rate as, as they like. Right. So they're the main things I say to them. Yeah. And sometimes if somebody wants me to listen to a mix, um, you know, before they lock it in, I'm always happy to do that so they, they just send me it I'll just listen to it and say look you know it's a bit too boomy or or whatever if they, if they want me to give them some some guidelines I'll be happy to do that yeah mm. essentially um, people uh, should make sure that they listen to their mixes in quite a few different environments I always tell them that particularly if it's a home recording job I keep going back to that because I know professional guys they normally nail it. They know their room and their sound. But if they record, if you're recording at home, you shouldn't fall into this trap. And the biggest trap and mistake is mixing, producing, recording everything in this room at home, off in your bedroom, and never taking it outside. You should always be printing versions of that track, going to the car, going to a friend's house with a good stereo, putting it in your iPod, throwing headphones on. Um, the biggest mistakes occur when people spend a year in their bedroom making an album and they've never listened to it outside the bedroom. That's when really big mistakes occur, you know, unless they happen to have a really good acoustically treated bedroom, <laughs> which often doesn't happen, you know. Um, but that's the biggest tip I give everyone. Make sure you've heard it lots of times outside everywhere. Go to your lounge room, go to your friend's house and it, it's quite revealing. And then come to mastering. You know, do it when I, when people call me in the middle of a mixing job or a recording job, I say early on, even if you're six months away from, you know, mastering, come down, even if you've got one or two songs ready, have a listen in a really good room mm. and straight away you'll hear if there's really, you know, big flaws occurring in your listening environment. We hope you've enjoyed discussions in audio mastering and have a greater understanding of the necessary processes and what is involved for an experienced engineer to attain a professional standard of audio fidelity. Peace.